going within to contact the great Tao and to solve the mystery of being is a theme we find in many of the world's religions. The masters of Huai Nan, a Taoist collection of sayings on civilization, culture, and government composed over 2,000 years ago, teaches, the Tao cannot be bought from others. It is attained in oneself. If you abandon yourself to seek from others, you are far from the Tao. On the importance of true self-knowledge, the Master Zahu Ai Nan says, clarity does not mean seeing others, just seeing oneself. Acuity does not mean hearing others, just hearing oneself. Understanding does not mean knowing others, just knowing oneself. This is like the advice Gautama Buddha gave his disciples in his last address. He said, Whosoever shall be a lamp unto themselves and a refuge unto themselves, to no external refuge, but holding fast to the truth as their lamp, and holding fast as their refuge to the truth, shall look not for refuge to anyone beside themselves. It is they among my disciples who shall reach the very topmost height, but they must be anxious to learn. Christians have thought this concept to be pagan, but if you look at the chart of the presence, you realize it is not pagan at all. Buddha spoke of the seed within us, the seed of the Buddha. It is the same point of the seed of the inner flame, which we call the Holy Christ flame, and of the one born out of the Tao, called the only begotten Son. And so if we look within to the flame, we are not worshiping the self. We are finding that point of identification by which we were created in the beginning. Buddha is teaching us the same as Lao Tzu. Go back to the point of your beginning. And the point of your beginning is in yourself. And your real self is with you. The pattern, the full pattern of your identity. Find the great Tao within you. And you will find me, for I am one with that Tao. Buddha was concerned that his disciples would go here and go there and follow this one and that one. It is the same teaching of Jesus Christ. He said to his disciples, when they tell you to go here, to go out in the desert, to go there, go not, for the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus taught us that God has placed a portion of himself within us. That means we are self-sufficient unto God. On this we must stand. Jesus also told us, my grace is sufficient for thee. These words of Jesus have come to me this week over and over again. My grace, what is this grace? Is it not concentric rings of the aura and the halo of Jesus Christ or Gautama Buddha or Mother Mary? Is it not those rings of light of energy? And when we say a Hail Mary or an Our Father or a Buddhist mantra, do we not become congruent with that vibration and therefore find sufficiency in that grace of the Tao that they all are wearing? They wear the Tao as a garment. They present themselves to us wearing this garment, and we see it with the inner sight of the soul. And we look at ourselves, and we look at our rags, or we look at those things we wear and think that we look wonderful and rich. And then we look at the grace of the garment of the Tao, and we would trade all these things for that seamless garment of light. 
Take the second or third century Christian text called Teachings of Sylvanus. It says, knock on yourself as upon a door. These are the teachings of Jesus, which Sylvanus wrote down. Knock on yourself as upon a door. That is, knock on the door of your inner Christ and walk upon yourself as on a straight road. For if you walk on the road, it is impossible for you to go astray. As Jesus told the Pharisees when they asked him when the kingdom of God was to come, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Returning to the universal source of being by learning the ultimate truth about oneself and the universe is a major theme in Christian and non-Christian Gnostic writers. The term Gnostics describes a diverse group of sects that flourished mostly in the second and third centuries AD. They emphasized salvation through gnosis, the Greek word meaning knowledge. The knowledge they sought was self-knowledge and knowledge of God. One of the teachings of the Gnostics was that imprisoned within man is a divine spark or spirit, also called the seed of light. This divine spark is identical in nature to God and originally dwelt in the heavenly abodes, according to these Gnostic writers. But the divine spark fell to earth from higher realms, became entrapped by the illusions of this world, and forgot its divine source. The Gnostics described this state as sleepfulness, drunkenness, or ignorance. They taught above all else the soul or spirit had to be awakened to the realization of its divine nature so that it could ascend back to its original habitation, its original abode, the source. The Poimandris, a Greek Gnostic text from the second or third century, says, God the Father from whom man came is light and life. If you therefore learn that he consists of life and light and that you derive from him, you will again attain to life. This is just another way of saying what Lao Tzu writes in chapter 16 of the Tao Te Ching. All things flourish, but each one returns to its root. This return is called to recover life. To recover life is called the eternal Tao. To know the eternal is called enlightenment. We can know the eternal by meditating upon the face of our holy Christ self. For as we reflect that Christ self in the mirror of the soul, so the Christ self reflects the image of the great Tao, or the I am that I am. The Christian Gnostic text, the exegesis on the soul, written as early as 200 A.D., explains that the soul received the divine nature from the Father for her rejuvenation, so that she might be restored to the place where she originally had been. This is the resurrection from the dead. This is the ransom from captivity. This is the rising up to heaven. This is the way of ascent to the Father. Gnostic writings of the Mandean sect also speak of the restoration of the soul to its original home of light. In Mandean texts, the term mana is used to designate the divine particle of light or spirit in man. One text describes how a messenger appeared to mana and cried, shine forth and illuminate mana. When you are called, then rise to the place of light. Ascend, rise up to your former home, to your fine abode with the beings of light. Live among your brothers. Sit there as you were taught to do. Seek the house of your father. May your radiance go before you and your light be established behind you. May your throne be set up 
just as it used to be. We also find this theme of the return in the Upanishads. The Mundaka Upanishad teaches, this is the truth. As from a blazing fire, sparks essentially akin to it fly forth by the thousand, so also, my good friend, do various beings come forth from the imperishable Brahman and unto him again return. So Lao Tzu says in chapter 40 of the Tao De Jing, returning is the movement of the Tao. Author John Blofeld tells us how one Taoist sage explained what the return to the Tao meant to him. John Blofeld is one of our favorite writers. He has written wonderful texts for us on Quan Yin. In his book, The Secret and Sublime, Taoist Mysticism, Blofeld describes his visit in Peking with Tseng Lao Weng, a Taoist teacher. They were discussing whether Buddhists and Taoists had a different approach to the Tao, and Teng Lao Weng told him, as to approaching the Tao, be sure that demons and executioners, let alone Buddhists, are as close to it as can be. The one impossible thing is to get a finger's breadth away from it. Do you suppose that some people, this old fellow for example, are nearer to it than others? Is a bird closer to the air than a tortoise or a cat? The Tao is closer to you than the nose on your face. It is only because you can tweak your nose that you think otherwise. Asking about our approach to the Tao is like asking a deep sea fish how it approaches the water. It is just a matter of recognizing what has been inside, outside, and all around from the first. Do you understand? Blofeld replied, yes, I believe I do. Certainly my Buddhist teachers have taught me that there is no attaining liberation, but only attaining recognition of what one has always been from the first. In the course of their conversation, Sang Lao Weng laughed at Blofeld's suggestion that the difference between Taoists and Buddhists lay in their methods of approach. He said, any sort of a vessel, unless it founders or pitches you overboard, is good enough to take you to the one and only sea. Blofeld writes, Tseng Lao Weng's talk of rivers flowing into the ocean had put me in mind of Sir Edwin Arnold's lovely expression of the mystery of Nirvana. The dewdrop slips into the shining sea, which I had long accepted as a poetical description of that moment when the seeming individual, at last free from the shackles of the ego, merges with the Tao, the void. This I knew to be an intensely blissful experience, but it was Seng Lao Weng who now revealed its shining splendor in terms that made my heart leap. At a certain moment in our conversation, when Seng Lao Weng paused expectantly, I translated the beautiful line for him and was rewarded by a smile of pleasure and surprise. Eyes glowing, he replied, my countrymen are wrong to speak of the Western Ocean people as barbarians. Your poet's simile is penetrating, exalted, and yet it does not capture the whole. For when a lesser body of water enters a greater, though the two are thenceforth inseparable, the smaller constitutes but a fragment of the whole. But consider the Tao, which transcends both finite and infinite. Since the Tao is all, and nothing lies outside it, since its multiplicity and unity are identical, when a finite being sheds the illusion of separate existence, he is not lost in the Tao, like a dewdrop merging with the sea. 
by casting off his imaginary limitations, he becomes immeasurable. No longer bound by the worldly categories, part and whole, he discovers that he is co-extensive with the Tao. Plunge the finite into the infinite, and though only one remains, the finite, far from being diminished, takes on the stature of infinity. This, my friends, is true mysticism. He continues, mere logicians would find fault with this, but if you perceive the hidden meaning, you will laugh at their childish cavils. Such perception will bring you face to face with the true secret cherished by all accomplished sages, glorious, dazzling, vast, hardly conceivable. The mind of one who returns to the source thereby becomes a source. Your own mind, for example, is destined to become the universe itself. Think of this. Think of this profound realization as we have cast ourselves in a finite mold while our God has cast us in the infinite mold. His mold is greater. Our mold will yield to it. We shall know that oneness. Mark Prophet spoke to me of this mystery. He spoke of being in God and being one with God. He said, when God is in you and you are in God, then you are God. I said to him, do you mean you are part of God? He said, no, I mean I am all of God. That was 1972, and I wasn't ready for such a cosmic conception of myself or of himself. But since then, I too have tasted measure by measure my soul's oneness with the divine whole. This is a concept that Mark expressed in a poem that he wrote down from one who is called the Maha Chohan, which means great Lord. He is an ascended master who is a teacher on the things of the Holy Spirit. And this is this poem that embraces this mystical concept. As a rose unfolding fair wafts her fragrance on the air, I pour forth to God devotion, one now with the cosmic ocean. I have found that a little child can understand the mystery of this poem as the emanation of the rose becomes one with the allness. When Mark Prophet took his leave of us, he was heard to cry out. He cried it out unto the universe. It was like the self-discovery of the infinite one. He said, behold, I am everywhere in the consciousness of God. Having gone through a certain spiritual metamorphosis, we too can cry out unto the universe. Behold, I am everywhere in the consciousness of God. Let's do it. Behold, I am everywhere in the consciousness of God. Reminding you that chapter 40 of the Tao Te Ching is only four lines long 
I shall now take up line two. <laughs> this is a very interesting teaching. We savor it with tremendous joy. Line two reads, weakness is the function of the Tao. Other translators have used the words softness, yielding, or gentleness in place of weakness. Wing Sit Chan explains what Lao Tzu means by weakness. He says there is in the Tao De Jing a peculiar emphasis on what is generally regarded as negative morality, such as ignorance, humility, compliance, contentment, and above all, weakness. Lao Tzu is very insistent that we avoid the extreme, the extravagant, and the excessive, do away with desires, knowledge, competition, and things of the senses. He wants us to be contented with contentment and know when to stop. He encourages us to keep to humility and accept disgrace. In other words, seek no reputation for ourselves. To be willing to live in places which others detest, to be low and submissive, to be behind others but never ahead of them, and to become one with a dusty world. In short, to be weak. In the Tao De Jing, water, the infant, the female, the valley, and the uncarved block are used as models for a life, according to Tao. Practically all of these symbolize the life of simplicity. Some people have therefore regarded Lao Tzu's teaching as negative and defeatist, but this is not at all the case. Take the doctrine of having no desires, for instance. Having no desires simply means having no impure or selfish desires. It doesn't mean we should have no desires at all. While desires should be few, good ones are to be had and to be fulfilled. This is also true of knowledge. Knowledge in the sense of cleverness and cunning is to be discarded, but knowledge of harmony and the eternal, contentment, where to stop, and the self is highly valued. Or take simplicity. The symbol for it is the uncarved block, which is not spoiled by artifice. Metaphysically, it stands for the original purity and unity of Tao. And ethically, it stands for a simple life, free from cunning and cleverness, not devoted to the pursuit of profit or marked by hypocritical humanity and self-righteousness, but is characterized by plainness, tranquility, and purity. Lao Tzu wants us to return to the life of a single and simple community. He advocates a life of plainness in which profit, cleverness, selfishness, and evil desires are all forsaken. If the spirit is correctly understood, it is simplicity and not renunciation that is desired. Unless we understand this, we shall not be able to appreciate why Taoism has become the central principle in Chinese aesthetic enjoyment. Tea drinking, landscape painting, poetry, the landscape garden and the like are not to be deserted, but to be enjoyed in their simplicity. As in the case of simplicity, weakness is not to be taken one-sidedly or literally. Weakness is advocated for at least three reasons. One is that it is a virtue in itself that is as necessary in life as strength. In chapter 28 of the Tao De Jing, Lao Tzu says, he who knows the male, which is strength, and keeps to the female, which is weakness, becomes the ravine of the world. The ravine is a small, narrow, steep-sided valley. It is larger than a gully, but steeper than a canyon. He who knows the male and keeps to the female becomes the ravine of the world, because he combines in balance, the yang and the yin, strength and weakness. Secondly, weakness is often an outward expression of real strength. Chapter 45 says, what is most full seems to be empty, and the greatest eloquence seems to stutter. Thirdly, weakness overcomes strength in the long run. In chapter 78, we read, there is nothing softer and weaker than water, 
and yet there is nothing better for attacking hard and strong things. The weak overcomes the strong, and the softness overcomes the hard. Raymond Van Over explains the Taoist understanding of how water, which seems to be weak or soft, is in reality strong. It is in reality a yin strength. He writes, water pushes and recedes. It effortlessly penetrates every crack and crevice. When it meets resistance, it merely rushes by, giving way, and then filling up around hardness. Soon enough, the resistance of the hard and rigid tires and gives way to the gentler persistence of the water. Water thereby can overcome and wear down even the hardest rock. For this reason, rational discourse is incapable of defining Tao. How does one define the action of water wearing away rock? In such a slow process, the mental hardness of man's rational knowledge, the knowing of logic and illusory sense perceptions, is worn away until an intuitive, direct perception is achieved. It is because we are all seeking direct perception that we are studying the mysticism of Taoism. To understand the Tao, one must first realize that the heavenly Tao simply pursues its course and does not speak about it or symbolize its essence. So says the Taoist, let human action be like water that quietly seeks out all the crevices of life, but does it silently and effortlessly. In other words, he who is completely identified with the course of nature flows effortlessly with it, never fighting or resisting such infinite power, but utilizing its strength for his own fulfillment. As water finds its way gently, effortlessly, yet touching all points, so does the superior man conduct himself. In psychological terms, this implies the destruction of arrogance, egotism, and desire the destruction of the restless spirit that seeks to conquer and serve its own ends. To accomplish effortlessly is the virtue of natural man, the man who has Tao. Another perhaps more popular analogy sees man as the thinking reed who moves with the wind and is not broken as a rigid stalk would be. As gentle waters are to the physical body, so to me the gentle violet flame is to the inner bodies. The violet flame sweeps through surface debris, then gets to the harder and deeper substances of our human karma and the conflict in our psyches. It is ever so gentle, and it is totally painless. The violet flame is an aspect of the great Tao. We say it is an aspect of the Holy Spirit, for there are seven rays, seven frequencies and qualifications of light. The violet flame is a flame we invoke. It is like a spiritual waterfall. When we invoke it, it tingles. You can feel it quickening the mind and the heart and cleansing the body. As we invoke it, it begins to pass through us. And if you look at the lower figure in the chart, which describes yourself, you will see that it shows you standing in the violet flame. You could only be standing in the violet flame if you've invoked that flame. When the flame is all around you, it is raising your vibration, purging the vibration of inharmonies and discords. It is the tool of the great Tao. It is the gift of grace. It has an action of forgiveness. It is a power of transmutation. As you look at this chart, you can see that single thread that comes from the very top, passes through the I Am Presence, through the Holy Christ Self, and is anchored in your heart. This is called the crystal cord. It is referred to as the silver cord in the Old Testament. Over this cord flows the river of life. And as that energy enters at the crown and passes through the heart and it is distributed through the chakras in the body, we can qualify it with the color violet. We can send it forth to others whom we have wronged or who have wronged us. 
we can not only forgive, but we can call forth this flame to transmute these mutual wrongs and thereby achieve resolution, not only through personal interaction, but through this spiritual dimension where we use the science of the spoken word. When you know the gentleness of the violet flame, that it never complicates a condition, never accelerates, never causes a detoxification, so to speak, that you can't handle. It is so gentle that it is surely invisible in the sense that we are not aware of it. And yet it is the all power of God. It is so powerful that it can purge us. It can tr transmute the records of an ancient karma. I would like you to join me in giving a call to the violet flame so that you can feel it like gentle but powerful water passing through you. Let us take the decree, more violet fire. In this decree, we address our I am presence and we decree for a specific blessing of the violet flame to ourselves and to the world. Let us give it with great devotion together. Lovely God presence, I am in me. Hear me now, I do decree. Bring to pass each blessing for which I call upon the Holy Christ self of each and all. Let violet fire of freedom roll round the world to make all whole. Saturate the earth and its people too with increasing Christ radiance shining through. I am this action from God above sustained by the hand of heaven's love, transmuting the causes of discord here, removing the cores so that none do fear. I am, I am, I am the full power of freedom's love, raising all earth to heaven above. Violet fire now blazing bright, in living beauty is God's own light, which right now and forever sets the world, myself, and all life eternally free in ascended master perfection. Almighty I am, almighty I am, almighty I am. There is a simple mantra you can give to the violet flame whereby you affirm this flame where you are. It is simply, I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. When you say the word I am, you are saying the name of God. I am that I am which God gave to Moses. Let us take that affirmation of being as the affirmation of the great Tao with us that is releasing specifically this action of the violet fire together. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. It is because the violet flame is a spiritual flame that we feel its sense of gentleness, its ethereal nature, in contrast to the young forces of the world. Yet it is more powerful than all of them put together. Lao Tzu elaborates on the principle of weakness or softness through the Tao Te Ching. He says the softest, most pliable thing in the world runs roughshod over the firmest thing in the world. One who is good in battle doesn't get angry. One who is good at defeating the enemy doesn't engage him. If a soldier is rigid or unyielding, he won't win. If a tree is rigid, it will come to its end. Rigidity and power occupy the inferior position. Suppleness, softness, weakness, and delicateness occupy the superior position. The Taoist work the masters of Huai Nan teaches those who want firmness must guard it with flexibility. Those who want strength must preserve it with weakness. I would say that the beatitude of Taoism might be 
Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. The same principle of the superiority of softness or so-called weakness is at the heart of China's internal martial arts, such as Tai Chi Chuan. These arts are based on cultivating inner energies and developing softness that will triumph over the use of external muscular force. The body appears to be soft and gentle externally, but has a great concentration of internal power. This internal power is concentrated in the seven chakras. These chakras are lined up along the spine from the base of the spine to the crown of the head. The 20th century Tai Chi Chuan teacher Cheng Man Ching writes, those who love combat never fail to use stiff and brutish force to strike their opponents or fast techniques to grapple with them. This is the peak of yang, the extreme of hardness. If one's defense against this is hard, the result will be defeat and injury for both parties. This is not mastery. If my opponent uses hardness, I neutralize it with softness. If my opponent attacks with movement, I meet him with stillness. The height of softness and stillness is the peak of yin. When the peak of yang encounters the peak of yin, the yang is invariably defeated. This is what Lao Tzu referred to as softness and weakness, overcoming hardness and strength. Chen Man Ching also talked that energy and force are not the same. Energy is a property of the soft, the alive, the flexible. It is like shooting an arrow Shooting an arrow relies on the elasticity of the bow and string. The power of the bow and string derives from their softness, aliveness, and elasticity. If you have ever seen the Tai Chi Chuan adepts, their power is amazing. A small 70-year-old man, with what looks like very little effort, can repel the attacks of several younger, large men. Describing the concept of weakness or gentleness as advocated in the Tao Te Ching, John Na says that Lao Tzu teaches that restraint of self from anger, ambition, and meddlesome action is never merely negative in its consequences. Power, or de, is in it. Power for good. This is the power of virtue. Oft repeated is the conviction that in the presence of natural kindness, the strong become harmless, and by its means, the weak become irresistible. For example, chapter 49 of the Tao Te Ching says, To those who are good to me, I am good. To those who are not good to me, I am also good. And thus all get to be good. To those who are sincere with me, I am sincere. To those who are not sincere with me, I am also sincere, and thus all get to be sincere. To me, this is the ultimate softness. It is a nurturing, giving attitude. Rather than react to another's anger or emotions with more anger and emotions, why not respond out of the poise of the great Tao, from centeredness in the yin and yang of peace, and the Tao's gentle omnipotence, whereby you activate right desire, the desire to diffuse discord and enhance the state of equanimity. As the Masters of Huai Nan says, if you do not contend with anyone, no one can contend with you. The Book of Proverbs teaches, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. With patience a judge may be cajoled, a soft tongue breaks bones. The female Indian saint of Vayar, who lived a few centuries before Christ, wrote, Harsh words do not conquer soft ones. The arrow that strikes down elephants 
harms not a piece of cotton. The rock that is not split with a long iron crowbar splits when the roots of a tender shrub enter it. As John Noss said, the softness that Taoists speak of is a restraint from anger, ambition, and meddlesome action. The writings of the Taoist sage Zhang Tse speak of the sage who, like the Tao, remains unmoved and still. He says of the sages, all things are not able to disturb their minds. When water is still, its clearness shows the beard and eyebrows of him who looks into it. It is a perfect level and the greatest artificer takes his rule from it. Such is the clearness of still water, how much greater is that of the human spirit. The still mind of the sage is the mirror of heaven and earth, the glass of all things. Vacancy, stillness, placidity, tastelessness, quietude, silence, and non-action. This is the level of heaven and earth and the perfection of the Tao and its characteristics. But by vacancy and non-action, Zhang Ser is speaking of being in that receptive mode where unnatural human actions give way to the natural movement of the Tao. This is softness, that passive receptive attitude whereby you still the human self, the human tastes, the human doings, and let yourself be one with the great Tao. Along these lines, the 18th century Taoist adept Yui Ming wrote, look at this window, it is nothing but a hole in the wall but because of it, the whole room is full of light. So when the faculties are empty, the heart is full of light. Being full of light, it becomes an influence by which others are secretly transformed. They're secretly transformed because they do not know that that light comes from you or anywhere. They just receive the effect and the benefit. Yui Ming uses the analogy of lead and quicksilver to describe the superiority of the mind of Tao to the vacillating human mind. He said, in material alchemy, when quicksilver is exposed to fire, it flies off. When lead is put into quicksilver, the quicksilver is stabilized and they combine to form a mass without volatility. This is the Tao of controlling yin by means of yang. The human mind is mercurial and unpredictable. That is a yin condition. It gives rise to emotions about what it experiences and stirs up confusion after exposure to external influences. This is like quicksilver flying off when exposed to fire. If the mind of Tao representing the yang is always present, warding off danger, and one is always aware, then the human mind has no room to rise up. When we talk about the mind of Tao, we're talking about the mind of the one to which the Tao gave birth, that holy one of God, that holy Christ self. That's why the apostle said, let that mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus the mind of that universal Christ. And why did he say it? Because he knew the instability of the human consciousness. The masters have said that the human consciousness is unpredictable, and that is because of its yinness. So when we put on that mind, then we are acting through and in and of the mind of the Tao. This mind wards off danger one always is aware. Therefore, the human mind has no room to rise up. This is quicksilver being stabilized by lead. If you then go on to work diligently at increasing the positive energy of the mind of Tao, while reducing the negative energy of the human mind, increasing and reducing until no more increase or reduction is possible, then the human mind dies and the mind of Tao is stable within you. 
The seed of realization is then in your hands, and with it you can become a sage, an immortal, a Buddha. At this point, the foundation of essence and life is established. Now, if you go on to do advanced work, you will surely attain profound self-realization. The Ascended Master, Saint Germain, has given us a practical lesson on how we can maintain our control and our softness when everything around us is falling apart. He says, sometimes when you suddenly feel a disturbance, you are taken aback. You have a shock or a sudden reaction to the unjust acts of another. You momentarily lose your balance because the normal flow of the aura has been disturbed, as though someone had suddenly agitated the waters of the emotional body and the mental body. Your aura, he reminds you, is your sanctuary. And it is the sanctity of your God flame, your divine spark. Thus, before answering the demands of the carnal mind, whether yours or someone else's, the questioning, the praying for favors, etc., re-establish yourself, re-establish your centeredness. Do this by speaking quietly, softly, slowly, deliberately. In this way, you will not engage the anger, the impetuosity, the upsetness of anyone around you. Speak from the seat of the heart, the point of the Buddha, not from the seat of the scornful, as the psalmist counseled. Speak with the gentle but firm position of authority, the authority of the peace-commanding presence of the Christ within you. Speak out of the love of the Divine Mother's heart as she disciplines her children. Speak with strength, firmly, peacefully, powerfully, so that God may use your voice to still your aura and the agitation of another's. Be the calm presence in a vortex of crisis and calamity and learn the way of the immense power of peace itself. Take some regular deep breaths. For in the presence of anxiety, the heart begins to pound, and those who toss and tumble on the edge in a short breath manner thus add to their out of control state. As you remain poised in the center, Take another deep breath and release it. Quietly turn within to the seat of the heart and there maintain your God control. Thus, the soft answer turneth away wrath. If someone is speaking to you in a loud or rapid high-pitched voice, adjust the tone and answer with the gentle yet powerful words of the inner Buddha or the inner Christ. Give the mantra, peace be still, and know that the I am that I am within you is God. When you say peace be still, you are commanding your emotions, your mind, your fears and doubt to be still. Peace be still, and know that the I am that I am within me is God. Answer with helpfulness. Be a problem solver. Show the best and brightest side of things. Provide emergency care when it is needed. Keep your wits about you. And don't enter the vortex of another's anxiety, lest you yourself lose that center poise in the peace commanding presence. Here is a decree for stilling the emotions, the mind, the heart, and the aura. It was given to us by the Ascended Master Cuzco, who was embodied as a great adept in South America long ago. It is called the Count to Nine Decree. This is a prayer to the great Tao. It is a call. It is an affirmation. It is a decree. And it is a command that light manifest peace and harmony where we are. 
It is a command to our four lower bodies to be still, to the soul to be still. Count to nine. Come now by love divine, guard thou this soul of mine, make now my world all thine. God's light around me shine. I count one, it is done, O feeling world, be still. Two and three, I am free, peace, it is God's will. I count four, I do adore, my presence all divine. Five and six, O oh God, affix my gaze on thee sublime. I count seven, come, O oh heaven, my energies take hold. Eight and nine, completely thine, my mental world enfold. The white firelight now encircles me, all riptides are rejected. With God's own might around me bright, I am by love protected. I accept this done right now with full power. I am this done right now with full power. I am, I am, I am. God life expressing perfection always at all times. This which I call forth for myself, I call forth for every man, woman, and child on this planet. As we take to our hearts today the riches of the spirit, the banquet that has been placed before us, let us give a hymn of jubilation. <laughs> 